thought about it, there are a certain group of patients who don't want, I suppose, surgical FUE. And if Gislein's technique takes off, there'll probably be no need for me to give this lecture in two or three years' time. <laughs> I'm looking, I suppose, at the medical treatments, the guidelines, and looking at it scientifically through the Cochrane Library to see what is out there and whether it's based on evidence-based medicine or not. So we all know, I suppose, female pattern baldness or female uh, androgenetic alopecia, and we know that in women it's just along the top of the scalp. If you're losing it at the sides or at the back, it's going to be telogen effluvium or it's going to be diffuse hair loss. It's not going to be androgenetic alopecia. And um, the pattern, I suppose, is different in males and females. We don't really know what causes it. We know there is some association with the hydroxy epiandosterone, but it's multifactorial and it's polygenetic for sure. This is the sort of pattern we get here in females. And um, I suppose it's the central parietal region and there's preservation of the frontal hairline. In females, if you lose your frontal hairline, with, I suppose, your eyebrows, always be uh, careful that you're not dealing with um, fibrosing um, frontal alopecia, which is a variant of LP, lichen planus, as you know. So we get, I suppose, this form of hair loss across all races and ethnicities. Uh, it's more common in Caucasians. We're not sure why. And at seven years of age, over 40% of females suffer from the condition. Um, the androgen dependence is a little uncertain, but there's certainly a subset of FAA which has to do with hormonal dysregulation. It's usually diagnosed by clinical examination, and don't be afraid to take your patient, pull their hair. If you're going to tug and pull out six hairs, that patient's in trouble. If they're coming into you and you're tugging their hair and they're losing nothing, the chances are that they've had something like telogen mefluvium, which is going to, uh, I suppose, pass over, and what they need is some level of support. We all do this, use our different sort of scopes to see the density. Normal densities, we like to run post, I suppose, um, FUE is about 80 per centimeter. So believe it or not, I decided to for look first at the surgical ones. And we have hair clinics, I suppose, throughout the world, throughout India, um, the Middle East, Ireland, UK. And um, the studies for FUE actually were pretty weak based on the study. But we all know it works. But it's one of those, I suppose, methods that um, because it works, it hasn't been really scientifically evaluated in the same way that medical has. So these are medical evidence levels. You have level one, level two, level three, and level four. And level two is split into um, one, two, and three. And level one is that you have at least evidence from one randomly controlled trial. Now, if you look at the PRP studies, they're horrendous. And even some of the ones that Gislein showed me, um, I was with two of the doctors on two of those studies recently presenting the things. And I mean, the studies are rubbish, to be honest. And I don't like, like annoying any of the doctors involved. You cannot really do a study without a control. That's the first thing. And you can't do a study unless it's split or random or double blind. That's the second thing. Or else it's not acceptable to me or to anybody, any, any scientist. So this sort of thing where people are just injecting in PRP and showing us pictures afterwards, that means nothing. I mean, you could have maybe sent them down to Tesco and their hair would have grown or, you know, it's, you have to compare it to something. And this is one of the reasons why in Dubai we're not allowed to use PRP, um, at least in any of our clinics, because it hasn't been evaluated properly. Now, we all use it and it's fine. I know in my last lecture we were discussing it there with, with Charles a moment ago. But it's just the alopecia end of it is a little weak, let's say. So in terms of the medical um, ones that I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at minoxidil, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, which would be finasteride, the hormones, low-level light, I suppose, um, therapy, that's red light, and then other products. Minoxidil, as you know, 
was originally a drug that was used to treat high blood pressure. Blood pressure drugs have been wonderful to us. They give us the reason why depression was caused with Roe off in 19, I suppose, um, 57. We got the serotonin and dopamine um, pathways out of that. And we also, of course, knew from lonatin that it made hair grow whenever it was used for blood pressure. So that's where that drug came out of. Um, it's a pyrimidine derivative. It comes in two different forms, the 2% and the 5%. Now, the 5% has recently been passed by the FDA for females, but if we look at it, believe it or not, the evidence is fairly weak, but we'll get to that in a minute. It works through its active metabolite, minoxidil sulfate, which um, goes through the enzyme sulfophosphorus transferase, and that is present in the outer sheath of hair follicles. Um, we don't have to go into the chemistry of it per se. Um, it works through ATP-sensitive um, phosphorus channels. But there was 11 studies that I came across that had used topical minoxidil in female patients, and they were all up to at least to level 2, um, or evidence level 1 in all of them, and there was five of them up to, up to 2. And with the studies, it showed that the difference in females between 5% and 2% was not significantly significant. P was only 0.129. And from that, the recommendation is topical 2% solution, one twice daily. There isn't enough data for female patients to be wasting their money on a 5%, even though some doctors in the States recently, um, and a good friend of mine, was got it across the line for 5% as well. But just because it has got FDA approval for 5% doesn't necessarily mean it's doing any more than 2%. So if a patient's going out paying twice as much for something that's doing nothing, they might as well take it home and dilute it in half and um, use it every, um, and get twice as long out of it. So the response should be assessed for topical minoxidil at six months, and if it is successful, then continue it for maintenance therapy. Finasteride is an interesting one. And finasteride, we know there's two different types, both European-based um, finasteride, per se, and uh, deuterostarid, which um, is used less often, and the FDA are still in the middle of trials with it. Finasteride is a wonderful tablet in males, as you know. Um, it can cause permanent side effects, so be careful who you give it to and why. At the level of five milligrams, we use it in um, benign prostatic hypertrophy, as you know, and its problem rates of erection and ejaculation can be as high um, at the level of um, five milligrams as even 40%, but at the level of one milligram, it only drops down to about 1.4. So it's a comparatively safe drug. In terms of females, we looked at just two studies, or I did. They're up to evidence level two, and both of them, believe it or not, showed m more hair loss when the drug was used, uh, and statistically, um, progression of hair loss. And in postmenopausal females, it also failed to show any efficacy. So, finasteride is not suggested at all in the treatment of postmenopausal women with female pattern hair loss. That's not saying that it mightn't work if proper studies were done but just the studies that are out there at the moment um, shows that um, it's not effective and it makes more hair fall out. But that doesn't mean maybe at different doses, different subgroups, that it, it possibly could have an effect. Hormones, the hormones um, would include, I suppose, antiandrogens, anti-estrogenic drugs, Diane or Dianette, as it's called, I suppose, in Britain or Ireland, which is cytoproterate, um, was used. And again, there's no evidence scientifically to support the use of these drugs at all in female pattern hair loss. Um, now, it may be used um, in women with biochemical evidence of hypoandrogenism, which is a slightly different thing. Um, and I suppose the recommendations is there's no evidence to support um, th these drugs orally or topically. Products, we all use products, we all, we even make products uh, and, and sell them to our patients. 
And this is a market that really you'd have to treat with some certain level of suspicion. They're all going to do one of five things. They're either going to improve holo the follicle nutrition, they're going to promote hair growth by activation of the dermal papilla, they're going to have some effects similar to minoxidil by improving perifollicular vascularization, or they may reduce the activity of DHT, which is the ones that we have there. Sorry, I'll just run over slightly. Um, there's tons of these products, as you know, and um, I suppose to go through them quickly, low-level light therapy has been proven to work. It takes a bit of time, and we're learning more about it on a daily basis. Believe it or not, most of the thing they're telling you about revascularization is probably nonsense. What it seems to be doing is it is activating a genome which causes hair loss and hair shedding to be blocked. So uh, ongoing work shows that um, red light is something to um, put in your back pocket from the point of view that probably when we know it's working genomically, we'll be able to tweak it and make it work better. Amino acid cysteine certainly leads to increased growth uh, factors, and it has got across the line um, statistically significant. Copper and zinc have been suggested, but believe it or not, all studies didn't show any real correlation. Vitamins also sort of didn't really come up as, as effective as we would believe. Biotin and niacin, those two B vitamins, did have positive influence on growth, so they're okay to use. Um, flavonoids, um, the procyanides um, showed some level as well of conversion of telogen into anagen. Natural products, ginkgo, ginseng, and that, believe it or not, I couldn't get any trials on them at all, even though they're widely used. Caffeine um, does show some evidence of transfollicular penetration rates. Topical evidence of melatonin um, did show some induction, but the studies didn't fulfill the inclusion criteria that I would have used in it. Um, Mesotherapy didn't really figure at all, but it hasn't in an awful lot of proper scientific studies. And unfortunately, I think it attracts the type of people who aren't scientists, they're more on the peripheries, and that's not been offensive to, to them. But I think uh, the proper studies are usually done by doctors who deal in conventional medicine. PRP, I use it myself, and we use it widely, and I've won awards for using it back nine years ago for, for hair. Uh, in some of the techniques, so I'm not going to knock it. All I'm saying is proper studies haven't been done, including myself. I just don't have the time to take 100 patients and split their head and grow one side and not the other, but somebody's going to have to do it. Um, as I say, uh, low-level light therapy, we know now that it's working through uh, um, genomes. Thank you, and sorry that I ran a little over time.